A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms. Cam and Company, my name is Cam Edwards. Thank you so much for being a part of the program today. We're going to be uh, discussing bail in Memphis, Tennessee. Got an armed citizen story for you from the uh, Houston area, as well as a, a good deed of the day uh, involving man's best friend, as well as a, uh, well, a very good neighbor. Uh, we're also going to be talking with Cody Wisniewski of the Firearms Policy Coalition here in just a moment. So yesterday was a, a big day in terms of uh, filings to the Supreme Court. Um, you actually had two uh, different lawsuits uh, uh, get taken up to the Supreme Court, at least a request for uh, for cert, a uh, request for the Supreme Court to hear these cases, both of them uh, out of Illinois, dealing with Illinois' Protect Illinois Communities Act, the uh, gun and magazine ban that was imposed by the uh, Democrats in Springfield. I guess it was, gosh, last January, January of 2023 is when that law took effect. Um, and since then, the lawsuits have been, you know, popping up and down between district court and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. You've got a half dozen or so lawsuits. Um, National Association for Gun Rights, uh, they've got their case, Bevis versus Naperville, which actually uh, pre existed the Protect Illinois Communities Act. They filed a request for cert with the Supreme Court yesterday, as did the Firearms Policy Coalition uh, and the Second Amendment Foundation in uh, Harrell versus Raul. Uh, Kwame Rowell, the Attorney General of Illinois, again, challenging the Protect Illinois Communities Act. Now, what's interesting here is we just saw last week FPC and SAF sent another cert petition to the Supreme Court, this one dealing with Maryland's ban on so-called assault weapons, a case called Bianchi versus Brown. And I think actually the last time we had Cody on the show, we were talking about the shenanigans that the Fourth Circuit were playing there. Uh, you know, it was December of 2022 and a three judge panel heard oral arguments. So first of all, Bianchi versus Brown is another one of those cases that predates Bruin. And after the Bruin decision was decided, the Supreme Court granted cert, vacated the lower court decision, remanded Bianchi back down to the Fourth Circuit uh, for a do over in light of what they said in Bruin. So a three judge panel on the Fourth Circuit heard oral arguments in December of 2022. We had yet to see a decision from that three-judge panel, which was unusual, but even more unusual, before the panel issues its decision, the Fourth Circuit decides, you know what, we're going to take this case on bonk. We don't need to hear from this three-judge panel that has been working on their opinion for more than a year. We're going to take that case on bonk. We're going to take another case dealing with uh, uh, bans on uh, firearm sales to under-21s. We're going to take both of those cases on bonk immediately. And they're thinking... Uh, according to uh, Cody Wisniewski and uh, other uh, legal minds, is that the uh, Fourth Circuit wanted to preempt a decision that was going to be good for gun owners, a decision that was going to um, respect the right to keep and bear arms and call into question the constitutionality of Maryland's gun ban. And again, perhaps the uh, ban on gun seals to under 21s as well. So we saw that cert request uh, last week. It was early last week, maybe the week before last. And now we've got uh, these additional cert requests to the Supreme Court. So they have multiple gun ban cases to choose from. And the question now is whether or not the court is actually ready to hear one of these cases, which, you know, uh, we'll get into this with Cody. It's still maybe a little early for the court to step in, but the case can and has been made that the Supreme Court has to step in now to prevent further flagrant abuses of our right to keep and bear arms and a willful disregard, massive resistance, in the words of Paul Clement, uh, to the Bruin decision by lower courts. So let's get into it with Cody Wisniewski from the uh, Farmers Policy Coalition Action Foundation. Take a look and a listen. Cody, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me, sir. Glad to be here. Yeah, and uh, hopefully the Supreme Court is happy to see you uh, and the cert request that was filed here. Uh, so I, I mentioned in um, the introduction to this interview, so we had the Fourth Circuit uh, case, right, Bianchi versus Brown. Had that cert request filed was it last week or the week before last? Yes, sir, last Friday. Okay, and uh, followed up with uh, Harold versus Raul. 
Um, uh, NAGR filing uh, their own cert request for Bevis versus Naperville, both of which are still dealing with the the Illinois Protect Illinois Communities Act, the uh, deceptively named Protect Illinois Communities Act. So I, I, let's just talk, first of all, about this strategy here behind filing these requests. Why um, do you feel like the time is ripe now to bring this Illinois case back before the Supreme Court? Because it's not the first time that uh, there's been that request for the court to step in here. So wh where are we in that Illinois case that you're hoping will attract the, uh, the, the court's interest? Yeah, so in the Illinois case, we're still at the preliminary injunction phase, which we talked about before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at that preliminary injunction phase, right, we're still talking, we haven't caught into the full merits of the case. We were asking the court to, you know, hold the case and, and put a pause on it. But, and so normally that's not always the perfect time to get before the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court likes cases to develop before they get to the Supreme Court. They want, you know, to get a full kind of matriculation below. The problem that we have with the Illinois case is just how brutal the the seventh circuit's opinion was and the opinion strays so far from heller and so far from bruin and requires the plaintiffs you know and, and our co-plaintiffs and fpc to make s uh, s showings that are so far outside of what should be required in the second amendment case that it it should just draw the attention of the supreme court and so we felt that the way that the test was set forth by the Seventh Circuit is just so blatantly not in line with Supreme Court precedent that they should be aware and they should have the opportunity to set the record straight from day one. You know, of course, you know, Bruin was dealt with at, you know, like the motion to dismiss phase, something very early in the case. It doesn't have to be at the merits at all times. And this presents such an egregious step away from what the court has already done in Heller and what the court has already done in Bruin. That now is is the perfect time for the court to step in. All right. So the, the Bruin test says if the government wants to uphold a, a particular regulation, A, they have to, to, to show um, that it comports with the text of the Second Amendment, as well as the history and the tradition of the right to keep their arms as it was practiced in this country. Right. And they have to be able to point to, uh, if not identical twins, historical analogs from 1791, maybe 1868. But it seems like the court has said 1791 is really that key area. Um, what is the test that the Seventh Circuit has laid out? Now, I know the Seventh Circuit has said, well, these guns aren't even covered by the Second Amendment because they're like machine guns. So uh, they fall outside the scope of these Second Amendment protections. But what is the test that the Seventh Circuit has laid out for you to show and for organizations like the Farmers Policy Coalition to show that this law is actually unconstitutional? So the, the quote from the Seventh Circuit uh, is that the arms protected by the Second Amendment do not include weapons that may be reserved for military use. Now, this is, <laughs> you're making a face because it doesn't make any sense. So essentially what the Seventh Circuit has said is they took that language in Heller that says, well, you know, firearms like M16s may be banned, right? Heller didn't affirmatively state that. It just said, you know, they might be able to be banned. And the Seventh Circuit took that language and basically said, weapons that are used or sufficient for use by militaries are not protected under the text of the Second Amendment. So that creates two problems. First, it conflates the textual analysis with the historical analysis, right? The, the first thing that you look to under Heller and under Bruin, right, is the text of the Second Amendment. What did those words mean when they were written, when they were ratified in 1791? Now, we talk about this as like its own inquiry in the Second Amendment, but if you kind of extrapolate a little bit, you you step out, you know, 30,000 foot view, this is equivalent of going and saying, we look to the First Amendment to determine if this is actually a speech case that you're bringing. We look to the Fourth Amendment to determine if this is actually a privacy case that you're bringing, right? It's not like we're, we're this isn't unique in constitutional inquiry. And mm -hmm. because functionally what they're saying is, right, like if you sue over a, the state bans bookcases and you keep your firearms on your bookcases and you bring a Second Amendment claim, the court's going to look to the text and go, well, bookcases aren't what, you know, they don't fall within the scope of the Second Amendment. The, you know, just like if it was a Fourth Amendment privacy case and you're talking about a billboard, the court's going to go, well, the, a billboard doesn't protect your papers in your home or isn't a paper within your home. Right. So. The, the Seventh Circuit has conflated that part, right? They're looking to what is protected under the text when all bearable arms 
are protected under the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has already held that. That's not something that the Second Circuit needs, sorry, the Seventh Circuit needs to go back and look at again, right? All bearable arms are protected. Second, this idea that those that are useful in military applications are not protected is ridiculous. I mean, the prefatory clause of the Second Amendment, you know, dictates one of the intents behind the amendment. And that was to ensure that there was a militia and a militia that was well armed. And if you remove all weapons that are useful in any military context, how do you square that with the idea that you need to have a militia that has, you know, that there was a protected militia that has access to effective means of self and national defense. So this conflation and this focus or this uh, kind of extraction of these so-called military arms from the Second Amendment is a huge problem moving forward. It is. And it's, you know, it's it's, it's infuriating, but it's also kind of fascinating from a 30,000 foot view to see how the different courts have twisted themselves in a knot to uphold these bans, right? You've had, uh, I think it was a federal judge in Connecticut who said, well, the Second Amendment only applies to firearms that are useful in self-defense or were designed for self-defense. So um, handguns are protected by the Second Amendment, but your grandpa's uh, deer rifle is not, right? Uh, That uh, single barrel shotgun not protected by the Second Amendment, even though you've got other gun control advocates who say, well, that's the only type of gun that would be protected by the Second Amendment. And so to hear the Seventh Circuit come out and say, and they're not the only ones that have said this, uh, but uh, I think this is the highest court so far that has said, now these arms are just simply excluded from these Second Amendment protections uh, because they are like machine guns. As you say, this is absolutely insane to me. Um, it, it, it does stray so far from all of the Second Amendment jurisprudence that we've seen since Heller. How how what kind of impact do you think is this a sort of a, a double whammy here with the Seventh Circuit and then the Fourth Circuit playing its own games as you and I have talked about previously? Um, are you hoping that the Supreme Court kind of takes all of this in toto and recognizes okay, they're still treating the Second Amendment as a second class right? They're completely screwing with the Bruin decision. I think it was Paul Clement who uh, who said that the courts were engaged in massive resistance uh, <laughs> to the Bruin decision. Uh, calling out, uh, maybe calling back to the uh, Democrats' massive resistance in the state of Virginia, where I live, to Brown versus Board of Education, uh, where they actually shut down the public schools for five years rather than integrate, right? We're seeing that same type of recalcitrance directed against our right to keep and bear arms. So are you hoping that the court takes these cases in isolation, or are you hoping that they kind of look at everything that's going on right now uh, in these lower courts and, and say, all right, it's time for us to step in? I think it's the latter. And I think that's what's so powerful with these two petitions when read together. And I think that also, you know, indicates why Illinois is so important right now when viewed in light with Bianchi, because what you're seeing is we don't need to wait 10 years for, you know, Bruin to percolate down in the courts. We don't need these cases to sit and wait for the Supreme Court to kind of see what happens. We know what's happening, right? They're doing some of the very same things that they were doing before Bruin. Now they're just cloaking it under, you know, so-called originalism or a so-called historical analysis when it couldn't be further from that. So you see what's going on with Bianchi, with the Bianchi petition, right? You see the, the kind of egregious steps that the court has taken. You see what's going on in Illinois and the egregious steps that the Seventh Circuit has taken in changing the test. I mean, You can point to what's going on in the Ninth Circuit, of course. We've got cases where judges are saying that the only thing that are protected are weapons that are useful in self-defense. There's other courts that are saying the only weapons that are protected are those that are used, commonly used in self-defense, which is also not the test. And it's this intentional misreading. I mean, Bruin is not that cryptic. It's not that difficult. And all of these issues are arising. And so I think now is the perfect time for the Supreme Court to step in and just address one of these direct ban cases, right? So Bianchi, of course, deals with the so-called assault weapons ban. The Illinois case deals with both an assault, a so-called assault weapons ban and a magazine ban. These issues are properly before the court. And I just think that it would save everybody, not only everybody, a lot of heartache and a lot of time, but there's people that are at that are dealing with this, right? There are there are people behind these petitions. We're sitting out and kind of talking high level about the law. We're talking about two petitions working together. We're talking about Supreme Court process, but 
There are people in Illinois who are in this weird legal limbo where they're legally required to register something under a law that's blatantly unconstitutional, but they can't get a court to affirmatively state that or a court to at least pause the law so that they can, you know, exist and exercise their rights while the case is ongoing. You've got people in states across the country that don't know whether they're, you know, a felon one day, a misdemeanor one day. They don't know what, whether what they own is banned or is not or is regulated or is not. And you've got these governments that are taking advantage of the, you know, slowness of the legal system. And they're just passing laws to pass laws to stop people from exercising their rights. And that's what's so offensive here. And so I want the Supreme Court to step in in part because we've already seen what the Bruin application looks like, and the court can just step in and address this question. This isn't a new question, right? The court set forth the test in Heller and Bruin. The court has already dealt with an arms ban case in Heller. This isn't new. It's just reapplying its principle. But at the end of the day, I think it's really important that the Supreme Court step in because there's people that are sitting not knowing whether they can exercise their rights without becoming some sort of criminal. Absolutely. And, you know, and that that includes, by the way, a far larger universe than just the named plaintiffs in Bianchi or uh, Harrell or any of the other affiliated cases. I mean, you know, I was talking with the folks from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus via email this morning. Um, they just had a sweeping semi-auto ban introduced in uh, Minnesota. We've got one that's probably going to get to Governor Glenn Youngkin's desk in Virginia. Uh, Governor Michelle Luan Grisham introducing a state version of the uh, Go Safe Act, right, the gas-operated semi-auto ban. So, you know, it's not just that the the, the lower courts are taking advantage of the the uh, snail like pace of these lawsuits, but anti-gun lawmakers are doing the same thing, right? They know, OK, well, if we can get this law in the books now, it's going to be two, three, four years, maybe before it gets uh, up to the Supreme Court. And in the meantime, how many millions of Americans rights are going to be abused, infringed upon? How many of the, these folks who are again, they want to be lawful citizens uh, are going to be told, well, actually, you're a felon or you're a misdemeanor, maybe you lose your right to keep arms, maybe you go to prison for keeping this firearm. I, I think you're, I mean, obviously, I think you're right that <laughs> the time is right for the court to step in. Um, and as long as the court has not indicated an interest, I mean, they GVR'd Bianchi. So they have clearly expressed an interest in these issues. Um, now they've got the opportunity to address these issues. So what's the timing like here? The cert request filed in Bianchi last week, in the Herald this week, um, when might these cases come up for the court and conference or these requests? Yeah, come so, up? so the, the, you know, defendants will have some time to respond to the petition if they choose, you know, they don't have to, you don't have to respond to a cert petition, um, timing because of the way that the term is shaking out and everything that probably I would assume that we're looking at next term. So we're looking at these will probably not be set if they are granted they probably would be set for you know they could be set for briefing over the summer that's for sure um but we'd probably be looking at argument next term if the court decides to take the cases early okay. next term but we all know that they kind of reserve their landmark opinions generally for uh later so right even if it's argued early it could take longer to decide but that would be my guess when do you think we might hear from the court uh, their, their decision uh, whether or not to to grant cert in either or both of these cases? Could be before the summer. So, I mean, timing wise on these, you could get a response. Um, you know, we'll get a response if they decide to file one here um, within the next couple months. And then the court could certainly conference on it, could grant cert, and then could set the briefing schedule over summer, could have it heard in one of their earlier sittings um, starting next year. So. It certainly could be one that we know what's happening uh, in the legal realm sooner rather than later, which I recognize in, in the real world is a, <laughs> is a little bit of a wait. Well, yeah, there's court time and then there's, you know, everybody else's time. And, and <laughs> you know, and I, listen, I mean, I, I said after the Bruin decision came down that, uh, you know, going back to massive resistance in Virginia, Brown Board of Education was decided in 1954. The Prince Edward County Schools integrated in 1965. It took over 10 years for that decision to actually have teeth um, it, it, where I live. You know, I live just outside of Farmville, Virginia. So I am well aware uh, of the damage that can be done and the games that can be played. I've talked with people who went to school in church basements and private living rooms because, you know, the powers that be didn't want them going to school with their white sons and daughters. Um, and, you know, I have to say that 
talking to those folks and seeing Farmville now, you know, <laughs> the, the forces of regression lost. They lost bigly, as Donald Trump would say. Um, not only are the schools integrated, but you have, you know, blended families. People get along with one another. Uh, no race war broke out. And the forces of regression when it comes to our Second Amendment rights, I firmly believe are going to find themselves in that same place. They have been predicting all of this doom and gloom if we're ever, ever, ever able to uh, exercise our right to keep and bear arms without these types of crazy restrictions. And when these restrictions finally fall, they're going to see is that the law abiding gun owners are still the law abiding. The lawbreakers are still the lawbreakers, right? This is not going to put an end to violent crime, but it's not going to lead to an explosion of violent crime either. What it is going to lead to is a situation where we are allowed to exercise our rights the way that the founders intended and the way that generations of Americans have ensured that the Second Amendment remains a, a, a you know, a viable right. Um, I may be straying a little too far afield here, but, you know, one of the things that, that drove me crazy about the Hawaii Supreme Court's decision uh, mm -hmm. Was that little cutesy, you know, uh, uh, quote from The Wire about the thing about the old days, the old days. I think you can make a living constitution case for the Second Amendment. You know, if, if the if the if the living constitution is that, well, the constitution changes over time. Well, when was that moment that we rejected our right to keep and bear arms? We have over 100 million Americans exercising that right today. We have over 400 million privately owned firearms. More than half of the country is constitutional carry. So when was that magic moment? under the living constitution theory where we supposedly rejected that right. Yeah. I mean, you don't even, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate the point. Uh, in as much as I also d don't love living. Constitution. <laughs> I don't theory. either. I don't uh, either. But, but you're right. I mean, this hasn't, it's not like this is a, a publicly disfavored, right. And that's kind of the key, right? So for a long time, it was politically disfavored where, governments were, you know, infringing on it. There wasn't a lot of pushback for a long period of time. You know, we've talked and we've spoken before about, you know, when the Second Amendment legal movement really started compared to some of the others. But what's true is that the the public in the United States, the people, you know, who the, the Constitution was written for and, uh, you know, functionally by, uh, by way of proxy, have never stopped exercising that right, have never stopped seeing the importance in the ability to possess arms and to possess effective means of self-defense. And again, that's self-defense, not just from, you know, fellow man, from criminals breaking into your home, from people who, you know, want to hurt your, you, your family, your community, but also self-defense from your government. And that's a point that also has never really strayed away when you're talking about the public. I think the difference is, we're talking about these things more. And people are more willing to stand up today now than ever. And there's been that huge cultural shift of people are no longer, you know, quietly just sitting back and, and exercising their rights, but not talking about it. People are loud and proud these days. And people are also willing to push back when the government is just blatantly trampling on them. And I think you're seeing that happen more and more and more when it comes to gun rights. And I think that's a really important shift in the space. But more importantly, I think, you know, I've said this before, you know, Breitbart famously said that politics are downstream of culture. Well, courts are downstream of politics, right? And that shift in the culture impacts courtrooms. And I think we're starting to see that. And I think it's it's that flow is just a matter of time before, you know, these cases really start dropping. We've seen since Bruin, you know, monumental wins more wins than we saw in the 14 years post heller and so that shift has has already started to occur and i'm i'm really hopeful that now is the time to kind of put yet another nail in that in that gun control coffin and get the supreme court to weigh in on one of these straight ban cases well from your mouth to the ears of at least four justices because that's what it's going to take to grant cert five to win four to hear the case and uh Cody Wisniewski, I know we're going to be talking probably plenty of times before the uh, Supreme Court uh, deals with these cert petitions, but I would thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Appreciate all of your hard work. Now, listen, do you have one time? Do you have time for one more kind of uh, question out of left field? Oh, of course. Those are my favorite. Okay, good. Because I, you know, I, I've been asking these questions of some of the Second Amendment attorneys we've been talking to, and I don't think I've posed this question to you. I'm very curious. What made you decide to get into Second Amendment litigation? Why is this a passion for you? 
Yeah. So I, uh, I'm originally from California, so I apologize in advance to <laughs> everybody uh, who is now just tuned out. And I apologize to your, your listenership, which has just dramatically dropped off. But uh, when I was in law school, I was going through kind of the short version. When I was in law school and going through constitutional law, I went to University of San Diego, not certainly not a bastion of uh, conservatism or libertarianism. So there were very few of us in class that that thought the way that, you know, we think. Um, and while going through constitutional law, I realized that we spent a lot of time talking about constitutional law and not a lot of time talking about the Constitution. In fact, the Constitution itself was summer reading. It wasn't even a, a reading for the class. You immediately jumped into what the Supreme Court had to say. Going through this process, I felt really disenchanted with what the legal system looked like. And at the same time, my dad was starting to become a gun owner in California. And watching him try to navigate the California legal system around guns, while also seeing what the legal system looked like for the first time from kind of behind the curtain, uh, it really made me realize how impactful these laws and these regulations were on the exercise of rights. And so my dad's a mechanic. I'm the first person in my family to go to college, let alone law school. And to, to watch him try and navigate, like, you know, a one in 30 law, but you had a mandatory pickup after 30 days, but then, you know, California handgun roster and deal with all of these things while sitting in a room watching people just debate away people's rights. To me, firearms, gun rights was the is the microcosm of the macrocosm. It is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, you know, the Constitution goes the way of gun rights. If we cannot protect this thing, if we cannot ensure that we have this right and we are not able to exercise this right, then so goes everything else. And to me, that just became so important that that's where I wanted to dedicate my career. You know, I have always said that uh, behind every gun owner, there's an interesting story. And that is certainly the case, I think, with every uh, 2A attorney. Uh, I, listen, I... And is your dad uh, still a California gun owner? Does he, he call you every is. time Judge Benitez issues a decision and says, hey, look at this. I get a lot of excited texts, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, listen, I, uh, on behalf of uh, my audience, thank you uh, for being engaged in the fight. I am, I'm glad that, uh, uh, you know, you were inspired by your dad's experience to, uh, to fight for others. And, you know, it's, it must be a good feeling knowing that you're making a difference. I, it's, uh, it certainly makes it easier to go to work every day, but you know, like I said, with the petitions, the thing is we can get caught in the legal fights. We can get caught in the legal battles, but at the end of the day, it's the people. And if we can make it so that more people can exercise their rights and have access to their rights, then that's a pretty damn good day in my books. Absolutely. Cody's been, Cody Wisniewski with the Firearms Policy Coalition Action Foundation. As always, man, thanks so much for coming on the program. Look forward to doing this again very, very soon. Thank you for having me, sir. My thanks to Cody for joining us on the program, and we will all be watching, I am sure, very closely to see what the Supreme Court says uh, with either or both, I guess either or all, of these uh, cert requests going forward. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, uh, a big piece by WREG-TV in Memphis, Tennessee. Some say the bail system is broken. Here's what we found. Kudos, by the way, to the station for actually doing an in-depth, at least a relatively in-depth investigation of how the criminal justice system is functioning in Shelby County. I mean, we've heard from Tennessee Democrats. Oh, we got to have these new gun laws on the books. Oh, we got to have, you know, red flag laws. Oh, we got to ban these guns. Oh, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to have sensitive places. WREG said, well, okay, well, let's look and see what happens to people who are accused of violent crimes. Um. Chastity Beecher was the victim of a carjacking a couple of years ago. She was in uh, Fraser, Tennessee, suburb of Memphis. She said she had stopped by the store to get her mom something to drink. Uh, and she saw a guy with a gun. And he said, uh, B word, get out of the car. Aiming the gun at her and her young nieces. She uh, handed over the car, called police. She said, I can remember everything about the day so vividly. I couldn't sleep for the first 48 hours. I stayed up. If I closed my eyes, I see this man with a gun in my face. Um, police did make an arrest guy named uh, Malik Pegram. And as WREG reports, exactly two years later, on the day she was set to testify, she found out that Pegram had pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of attempted carjacking. And according to court documents, he received, ready for this, eight years probation 
Yeah, along with conditions like job training, random drug screenings, and 300 hours of community service. Something that Beecher said was a slap in the face. She said he'll get out again and he'll do something else. WREG said she was right. In April of last year, police say Pegram shot at a car. In August of last year, they say he broke into a liquor store. They caught him running from the scene with a gun. Uh, in custody, court records stated that pretrial services did an assessment saying that he was not on probation, even though he was. They called him a threat to public safety, but he wasn't flagged for his, quote, reputation, character, or mental condition. Uh, even though his mom had said that she was in fear of her son's temper, his dad noted paranoid schizophrenia running in the family. Um, none of that really seemed to matter. A judicial commissioner set his bond at $35,000 for both cases. <laughs> now, his probation was later revoked. And he's now being held without bond uh, through a a new system that requires defendants get a hearing within 72 hours of their arrest. It also allows financial situations to factor in, uh, supposedly to prevent defendants from getting stuck in jail because they cannot afford their release. Um, The problem with this is that there are some people who should remain behind bars because they pose a threat to the community, because perhaps they're a flight risk. Uh, and they're getting kicked out and returned to the streets, even though, again, they've been arrested multiple times while they're out on bond. It's just this, you know, catch and release cycle that gets worse as time goes on. Uh, one case they discovered a guy named Maurice Yarborough Carter. He's accused of carjacking a, uh, uh, basically a DoorDash driver, right? A food delivery driver last summer. Flagged as a public safety risk. Failed to show up for court five times. Had three previous felonies, had 20 previous misdemeanor convictions. His bond was set at $100,000. Guy named Justin Roberts, another one that uh, WRAG took a look at, arrested last February after being accused of asking a woman for money, continuing to grope her. Uh, While sitting in his bail, it was noted he had a record of not showing up to court, had a, quote, violent behavior history. He uh, was flagged for his reputation, character, and mental condition. There were um, several police reports that WREG looked at uh, showing that he's been on police radar since he was a teen. One mentions possible ties to a gang, been accused of multiple thefts, robberies, and assaults. His financial condition taken into consideration as well. His bail set at $10,000, and he was quickly released. And in May, he was arrested again. According to court records, he accosted children, robbed a man, and then committed another armed robbery, punching the victim in the face, knocking him unconscious. And then. He was arrested, and his bail was set at $100,000, and at the last report, he remains behind bars. So, WREG uh, did take a look at the bail system and found, it sounds like, it is, in fact, broken. Um, WREG reached out to Chastity Beecher, a woman who was carjacked by a guy who got probation, and uh, they said, well, now, you know, the DA's office is requesting that he get prison this time around instead of probation. She said, well, who's to say they won't slap him on the wrist again? And the WREG reporter asked, do you think the system is broken? She said, yes. Yes. It doesn't work for the victims. It doesn't. And a broken system isn't going to be fixed by the addition of more gun control laws. So all of the Democrats who are complaining that what Tennessee is lacking uh, are strict gun control laws? No. Sounds like what Tennessee is lacking is a functional criminal justice system that actually is capable of dealing with violent repeat offenders. Now, today's Armed Citizen story, speaking of violent offenders, uh, from Houston, Texas, where authorities say a man who was sleeping in a truck shot and killed a man who tried to break into that truck to rob him. Uh, This was in uh, Harris County. Uh, according to Sheriff Ed Gonzalez, uh, this was a Tuesday morning in the uh, 300 block of Parramatta Lane. The uh, armed citizen was sleeping in the back seat of his four-door pickup truck when another man, who may have been armed, entered the truck and tried to rob him, according to the sheriff. The uh, man, sleeping in the truck, had an AR-15 rifle, shot the alleged intruder several times, according to investigators. The uh, burglary suspect died at the scene. Uh, according to Sheriff Gonzalez, um, man was possibly armed with pistols when he entered the truck and attempted to rob the sleeping male. That again is when the sleeping male woke up, realized what was going on, and fired shots in self-defense. Uh, at this point, 
It looks like this was, a again, a clear-cut case of self-defense. No word on any arrest of the uh, armed citizen. We'll keep our eyes out for any more information. Again, this happened just this morning, so uh, details are a little sketchy, but hopefully we'll have an update for you here in the uh, next day or two. And finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, we'll able to do the right thing. i got to say the headline to me completely misses the really important part of this story. But, you know, local news, man, they love... A story with a uh, an animal angle. So here you go. She keeps going in there looking for him. Dog waiting outside. Owner's burned home as he fights for his life. Then we get to the part about Vance Van Landingham and a neighbor pulling Tony Stevens out of his burning home on Sunday morning. Listen, I feel bad for the dog. I am a dog lover. But uh, to me, that's the most important part of the story. Uh, Vance Van Landingham said he heard someone honking their car horn outside of his mobile home on the south side of Indianapolis. He said, I came outside to see what it was, and I saw smoke coming from the front of the trailer. So that's when he told his girlfriend to grab a fire extinguisher. He ran over to the trailer and realized that his neighbor, 62-year-old Tony Stevens, was still inside. He said, before I was even on the porch, the heat just got worse and worse. He said, I kept calling out to him. He wasn't able to speak, so all I heard was a loud moan. And so I started reaching in that direction. I started reaching in, and I felt his arm, and I started dragging him. Van Landingham said, there's an individual who happens to go to this church across the street who happened to be coming by, and he helped me once I got under the porch to get him away from the house to safety until the fire department got there. Uh, Van Landingham says he cannot recall the Good Samaritan's name, but he wants him to know how thankful he is. He said, if it wasn't for him, me and Tony probably both would have been in the fire. Uh, Van Landingham credits the uh, skills they learned when he was 12 years old in the cadet program of the Paragon Volunteer Fire Department. He says, they taught us a lot about situations like this. And in an instant, all of that came back. He said, I believe that's why Tony's alive. Tony Stevens taken to a local hospital uh, in critical. Well, he was taken in serious condition. His condition, last report, was critical. Uh, his brother told the local media that doctors had put him in a medically induced coma. He has swelling in his chest. Uh, his brother also said that Stevens is an Army veteran on a fixed income. Moved to his home near his brother with his dog, Wu, about six months ago. Neighbors have been looking after Stephen's dog, giving him food and shelter. They say the Akita often uh, walks through the burn mobile home looking for his owner. Van Landingham said uh, it's really sad to see her lying there in the front yard of the home waiting for uh, her owner to come back. And I hope and I pray that uh, that day is going to come for Wu and for Stephen's family and friends in the very near future. But giving him a fighting chance of survival, Vance Van Landingham, and again, that anonymous Good Samaritan in Indianapolis, in the right place, at the right time, will it enable to do the right thing to help a man in need? We thank you for your very good day, a good, good, good deed. Excuse me, let's try that again. We thank you for your very good deed, and I do hope that the story has a happy ending. Now, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program today. Looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. We're going to be uh, talking, uh, hopefully, with the folks from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus about the onslaught of anti-gun legislation that has been uh, introduced, including a sweeping semi-auto ban. Um, If we're not talking Minnesota, we're probably going to be talking Virginia because we've got dozens of bills that are headed to uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin's desk, and he's still keeping a, a pretty closed mouth when it comes to what he's going to do with those bills. So uh, either way, we're going to be taking a look at some of these state-level gun control laws or gun control bills, rather, that have been filed uh, on tomorrow's Cam and Company. I'd encourage you to check out BarryandArms.com throughout the day that we're keeping up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. If you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Let's go to BarryandArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. You get a significant savings on your membership. We're going to give you content you won't find anywhere else. I just missed my uh, out cue there. Because your support does matter, and it truly does make a difference. No second takes on this show. Uh, uh-uh. uh. No, we're gonna we're gonna bleep it. We'll do it live to disc, as uh, Bill Riley would have said. All right. Anyway, we will talk to you again tomorrow with another edition of Barry and Arms Cam and Company. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free. <laughs>